Good morning, or afternoon rather, morning. It's a good start, isn't it? Now, I want you to start this talk by taking a look at the glass of water in front of you, if you've got one. Glass of water, bottle of water, whatever it is, just take it in your hand and uh, look at it up close. And just tell me what you see. It's colourless, it's still, it's a bit featureless to be honest. Boring, maybe, is the word you're using in your head right now. So what on earth are we going to talk about for the next 15 minutes? Well, as it happens, boring things are things that I get interested in sometimes. And in moments of idle speculation, I think about them. Years and years and years ago, in one of these idle moments of speculation, I was thinking about water in the context of this. This is the pH scale. So over there, pH 1, acids, pH 14, alkali. And I was thinking to myself, the, the only thing I can think of that's pH 7, neutral, neither acid nor alkaline, is water. And I you know, started to think about that. And I thought, oh, of course that makes sense, because an acid is just defined as something uh, that uh, has a concentration of H plus ions, hydrogen nuclei. And the more you have of them, the further, the lower the pH. The more OH minus ions you have in solution in something, hydroxide, you get higher in the pH scale. So sodium hydroxide drain cleaner is 14, pH 14. And that is an alkali. The only thing that has an equal number of H plus and OH minus ions is HOH, which is water, obvious. It's very neat too, right? It's very neat. Another neat thing about water is how it boils at exactly 100 degrees Celsius and freezes at exactly zero degrees Celsius. Very, very neat, considering how messy nature actually is. And you think, how is this possible? Of course, we've defined the temperature scale using water. <laughs> That's why it's like that. You know, convention does play its role in science. And you know, I started to pull at these sorts of neat hanging threads just for, for my own entertainment. And what I discovered was something actually quite disturbing and uncomfortable. Water isn't the boring liquid that you think it is. It isn't this sort of placid thing in the background. It's actually very, very, very strange stuff. I mean, for example, this, uh, this is an iceberg, as you might see. And what you're seeing there is a solid ice floating on liquid water. They're the same material. And this obviously is beautiful. And you're thinking, well, what's weird about that? Well, the weird thing is, of course, that you can see the iceberg at all. Ice is a solid. It should float down to the bottom of its liquid, like everything else in chemistry. But it doesn't. It floats. Because when water molecules freeze, they produce large gaps in, them, uh, in the crystal structure, which means that ice is less dense, and it floats to the top. This is so strange in chemistry terms that it's kind of mind-boggling. And we, we don't see it every day. In fact, you're probably used to something like this, where ice is in your drink, and you don't notice the fact that it's floating. And that is weird chemistry. That is so strange. This is a substance that you just don't see the weirdnesses of. Right now, in front of you, you've got liquid water. The molecule H2O is very light. Similar light molecules at this temperature and pressure in this room would be gases, ammonia. Uh, methane. These things are gases. Why is water a liquid at this temperature? It kind of makes no sense. This is a weird substance. Chemists are slightly frightened, frightened of studying it. But if it wasn't so strange, and there are many, many more strange things about it, if it wasn't so strange, then we wouldn't be here today. This is a substance that, for example, can flow upwards against the force of gravity. It floats on its own liquid. It makes no sense. If you want to try and understand some of these things, I mean, this is not magical. It is because of certain understood bits of science, at least in the basic sense. You have to look at the structure of a water molecule. There it is in the middle, H2O, two hydrogens and an oxygen in the middle. And what you're looking at is uh, a molecule that's slightly bent at about 104 degrees. And it's neutral, electrically neutral. It just floats around happily being electrically neutral. But that isn't the end of the story, of course. The oxygen is 
ever so slightly negative, fractionally negative. And the two hydrogens are ever so slightly positive, just in terms of the electronic structure. So you get this slightly, just a very slight dipole a change in the electric, electric uh, poles around the water molecule. And that means that the hydrogen of one, with its fractional positive charge, is slightly attracted to the oxygen of another molecule. And the hydrogen of that one is attracted to this one. This is called a hydrogen bond. It happens in many, many different types of molecules that have these sorts of bonds. But with water, it's particularly special because water can form four of these hydrogen bonds. And they're really small fractional charges that can come and go as the uh, molecules move around. In a sense, they're not that important if you, if you were to just to sort of look, to look at the values of the bonding. The bonds that combine hydrogen and oxygen are way stronger than any of these bonds here. But that slight attraction between different molecules in water gives it a set of really interesting properties that virtually nothing else has. So, for example, the, f the fact that water is a liquid at room temperature and pressure is because in liquid, there are all these bonds forming all the time, and it just takes that little bit extra energy to transform a liquid into a gas, which means that at this temperature, water is a liquid, whereas something like ammonia boils at several hundred degrees uh, below freezing. Maybe not several hundred degrees, 150 or something. And this also leads to many other very interesting properties. So, let me go back one. one. The other thing about this is that it shows that water loves to stick to itself and it loves to stick to everything else around it. You know, when, when Newton and the alchemists were looking for the universal solvent, they didn't think that water would be it, but it is. It dissolves absolutely everything given enough time. If you think about the Grand Canyon, that's basically been dissolved by water over hundreds of thousands, millions of years. Water dissolves everything. It loves to stick to things, but it doesn't like to stick to anything more than it likes to stick to itself. It's quite a narcissistic molecule in that respect. <laughs> if you've ever, if you've got a glass of water in front of you, if you look at the edges of the, the surface of the water, you'll see that it, they go up on the water, on the side of the bottle. The same thing happens on ponds and everything. It is a slight meniscus at the top. And that's because uh, water sticks to itself and at the boundary of different, mo different media, let's say water and, and air, it's actually, if you're, it's actually relatively difficult to pierce the top of the water. Now, you and I can do this because we're you know, much more powerful than the hydrogen bonds, but like insects, insect, insects like pond skaters and those kinds of things can just float on these things and treat them as if they're solid surfaces. And that same property, the ability for water to stick to itself, especially on very narrow tubes, if you imagine these bottles of water in front of you are very, very, very narrow, the meniscus would be quite pronounced. It allows water to actually flow upwards against the force of gravity, which is useful if you are a tree and want to get water from your roots to the crown of your leaves. Uh, useful for all of us because it means that blood can get to the tips of, uh, right to the top of your brain in small capillaries. In fact, water is so fundamental to life that it's doing multiple, multiple jobs inside you and all life that you wouldn't be able to live without it. It's uh, right now transporting energy into and out of your cells. It's creating the environment in your cells that mean that proteins and DNA actually function in the right way. They fold into the right shapes to do the jobs they need to do. Everywhere on Earth that there's water, there is life. And there is no life on Earth without water. In fact, it's often thought that life started in water itself three and a half billion years ago at the bottom of the ocean where hydrothermal vents, these cracks in the ocean floor, are sort of spewing heat, uh, lots of energy up through the, uh, through the ocean floors. Uh, it's, it's a place where minerals and heat sort of combine. And three and a half billion years ago, the early ancestors to what we now call cells would have started to be created in those sorts of environments. And another interesting property of water allowed for the complexity of life that we see around us. I've told you about water floating. It's a curiosity for sure, you know. But it's also fundamental in us being here today. 
across the history of the Earth, we've had many, many ice ages. And so that's the, where the surface of the Earth completely freezes over. And if there was life evolving at those times, at any of those times when ice ages happened, and water froze in a, let's say, normal way, in other words, from the bottom up, from the bottom of it's wherever it is, up to the surface, then every time there was an ice age, any microbe or life form that was evolving and living at the bottom of ponds and rivers would have been destroyed. The Earth would have been sterilized pretty much every single time there was an ice age. But because water freezes from the top down, it means that the water underneath, as something freezes from the top down, is insulated from whatever conditions are on the, on the outside. So therefore, for the three and a half billion years that life has been on this planet, there's always been liquid water because of this fundamental strange property of ice floating. There's always been liquid water and a place for life to continuously evolve into the rich complexity that we see around us today. And if water can do all these things here on Earth, the question you've got to ask yourself is, why can't it do it anywhere else? And this is an interesting area of discovery because we now know that there's water on every single body in the solar system, pretty much every single body, from the, from the poles of Mercury to the mountains of water ice on Pluto. There's water everywhere. On Enceladus, this is a moon of Saturn. We recently discovered that underneath the thick icy crust, there are oceans of water, huge oceans of water. In fact, they burst out of the surface. This is a picture um, taken by Cassini. They burst out, sort of, this is a graphic, but the, these just plumes were discovered by Cassini. And these are plumes of water just flowing out. We now know, of course, that the oceans on Enceladus are actually warm. And we also know that they sit on rocks. Now, that's very similar to the conditions in which uh, the water on life on Earth started. This is Enceladus. Europa has similar conditions, which is a moon of Jupiter. There are probably other bodies on the solar system where this happens. And if you look beyond the solar system, of course, in recent decade, we've confirmed the existence of several thousand exoplanets which orbit other suns. The predictions are that there are trillions of these in our galaxy, exoplanets. Now, we don't know how likely it is that when you get conditions like this, life will spontaneously start. We don't know that number. But what we do know now is that the number on the other side, in other words, the possibilities for it, are exponentially higher than we knew before. Because there are going to be, in those trillions of planets, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of planets with liquid water, which is the, essentially the signature you look for when you start to look for life elsewhere just in case you don't know what water looks like. <laughs> um, so th the thing about water, uh, of my idle curiosity at the beginning, which was that why is it pH 7? Why is the temperature scale so neat? We've already handled that one. That's because we've defined these things using water and so many other things in science and culture, all of our, our lives, everything is defined by water. Our entire life, world is built around water. The first civilizations started around you know, coastlines and rivers, because we need it so much power and uh, all, uh, politics are based around water in many respects. And to be honest, they are, this, is, uh, this is the substance that's our connection to the very first humans. If we go back to thousands of years to meet the first humans, we wouldn't understand what they ate, what they uh, spoke, or what the language they spoke, what their customs, but we certainly understand what they do with water. And they would understand what we do with water. It's our connection also to anything that might be out there, because out there in other civili ancient civilized, uh, faraway civilizations, if they exist, or even simple life forms. They may use other molecules to build their bodies. They may use other molecules to transfer genetic information from one generation to the next. But I bet you there's a very high likelihood that they use water to make all those things actually function. So once again, lift up your glass of water or your bottle of water and look at it now. And just tell me one more time, what do you see in that glass of water now? Thank you. 